All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, welcome. My name is Nefeshi Israel, and I'm the Director of Programs for CA for the Arts. I'm excited to have each of you here for our final session of our four-part webinar series on arts and health, as we recognize the arts as a powerful tool to enhance the health and well-being of our communities. And I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the many artists, culture bearers, and creative workers who have been, who has been serving as health and wellness practitioners for generations. We understand that while the conversations around arts and health may seem new, these practices have been deeply rooted in diverse communities worldwide. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. We'll have some introductions in just a minute, but we have some uh, some basic ground, what is it called, housekeeping. My tongue got tied for a second. So please introduce yourself in the chat, acknowledge the indigenous land where you reside, and if you'd like to share share a link for folks to connect with you or learn more about your work, this event is being recorded and the recording slides and all resources will be shared with all registrants. And so that will be within the next day, you will get an email with the recording and the slides and additional resources, along with a playlist on YouTube with our previous arts and health webinar uh, series. You can go to the next slide there, please. Thank you. If you have any questions, questions are welcome at all time. Be sure to use the Q&A feature in the, on Zoom. If you click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, then you'll be able to ask the questions and panelists will be able to answer you directly. Also, please avoid buzzwords and explain references and acronyms in the chat just so that we all have an understanding of what you're referring to. Please be respectful of, our, of your fellow advocates here today honor perspectives and give others time to speak. And if you're not comfortable speaking at any point or excuse me, putting anything in the chat, you can follow up with us directly. We'll add some email addresses in the chat um, for you to be able to reach CA for the Arts if you have any questions. And lastly, I would like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor for the series and our arts of our Arts and Health Initiative, the Music Man Foundation. Now I'm pleased to pass the spotlight to CA for the Arts and Health Special Consultant, Jennifer Kuo. Thank you, Nefesha. Hi, everyone. So before we kick off today's program, I just wanna share with you all again, some quick Zoom tips to optimize your virtual experience. Uh, since we have a fully packed schedule, the Zoom tip slides and instructions will be shared with you in the chat box for you to refer to by Terry on our team. So please look, that, uh, look for it in the chat box. Um, so three tips, you'll be able to turn on and off closed captioning for subtitles as you like. And the next one, you have some viewing options. So when a uh, deck is being shared like it is now, you can adjust um, how big you want to see the speaker and how you know big or small you want to see the slide deck. And then the third Zoom tip is that you'll be able to save the chat transcript uh, with all the messages from everyone in the webinar and any private direct messages between you and other participants. Uh, there should be three dots somewhere, it might not be here, it might be on the bottom towards um, the chat box window. So look for that. Uh, the key for this one is to make sure you click on save chat right before the webinar ends. That way it captures everything from the beginning to the very end before you leave. Okay, all right, so whoops. Okay, so today's webinar will explore the critical role of advocacy and policy in advancing arts and health initiatives. As a connection between the arts and well being gains recognition, what are the systematic barriers that need transformation to support and expand these efforts? Our panel of experts will dis discuss effective advocacy strategies, the importance of cross sector collaboration, and ways to influence public policy. In the spirit of creativity, each webinar has been kicked off with a creative moment, and today will be presented by Nat Natalie Godinez with Visual Arts. There will be an interactive portion, so please take a moment to have ready a sheet of blank paper and some coloring utensils of your choice. Then each speaker will present for about 10 minutes, and the last 30 minutes will be a discussion with all speakers guided by Julie, CEO of CA for the Arts, and some Q&A from the audience. So again, as a reminder, please pop in any questions you have for the speakers at any time during this webinar by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom. This will allow our speakers to see all of your questions directly without it getting lost in the chat box. 
And then we will conclude with some announcements. So let's get started today. For the creative moment, I'd like to introduce Natalie Godinez, who is a Los Angeles-based artist, educator, and community advocate raised in Tijuana, Mexico. Natalie explores memories, identity, and relationships to places and language through textiles, printmaking, process-based art, text, and collaboration. Her work aims to be a tool for conversations about our shared experiences, the possibilities of our imaginations, and our desires to create change in the world. So please have a sheet of blank paper and some coloring utensils nearby, and then we will go ahead and welcome Natalie. So give me a moment while I get Natalie's cameras on screen here. And get your camera with the artwork. All right. Welcome, Natalie. Hey. Get away. Hi. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, wish I could see you, but <laughs> I see that there's a lot of people logged in. So my name is Natalie and Galinas, and I'm, um, like Jennifer mentioned, I'm based in LA. Um, so I'm going to lead you in a really short activity. Um, it's really fun. And if you've ever taken an art class, you've probably done this before. Um, but this is something that I've been doing with um, students, I've been an educator for about 15 years in different capacities. Um, and um, I work with um, everyone from preschoolers to adults. Um, so this is a really simple activity to kind of um, get you grounded and um, just something to do if you're facilitating a meeting um, or anything like that. So it's called the blind contour drawing. And I like to um, do these uh, drawings um, as a way to kind of start my day when I'm working on some drawings for an artwork that I'm working on. So um, all you need is um, just like a pencil or anything you like to draw. And then and, and then you're gonna pick something that you would like to um, you would like to focus on. So um, it could be yourself looking at yourself on the screen. It could be um, an object that's nearby you or anything. So I right now I have a planter that's like a little duck in front of me. So the trick to a blind contour drawing is that you're going to be drawing without uh, looking at your paper. Um, I'm going to be cheating a little bit because I can see myself on here. But uh, so you don't look. You look look at the object and not at the paper. Um, and then you're not going to pick up your pencil or your utensil um, the whole time that um, that you're drawing. So um, it's really simple, um, like I said. So I'm gonna start by drawing over here and sometimes the drawing so kind of wacky. So it's kind of fun to do. Um, so, um, and then it's really cool to do it with students, um, them drawing each other um, because um, it's a good like icebreaker activity or even in like a community setting if you're leading like community uh, workshop um, that you want people to kind of get to know each other because it's not about, it's all about the process and it's not about what the drawing is actually going to look like. So, um, like I said, I had like a little, it's like, it was like a little duck drawing, but it looks a little wacky. So, um, it's really cool because you have shapes so I can add something else. So I'm going to also draw, I'm going to draw myself on top of this. I'm going to look at myself on the screen and then when I draw the shape of my face. Um, and um, so, yeah, this is a good icebreaker. And if, I don't know if, if any of you have ever taken an art class. You've probably done this. They did make you do this so you can learn how to draw properly by looking at the subject you're drawing instead of the, the paper. So. I added, I combined two drawings so you can kind of see where the faces are. And then the really cool thing you can do with this um, after is that you can take any kind of coloring utensils and kind of just think about this as like shapes instead of an actual drawing. And um, I don't know if any of you would do like those coloring meditation type activities, um, but it's just like that. And you can do coloring pencils you can use for things um and um yeah and something really cool about today's webinar is that I've actually been working for the past five 
to six years on kind of combining arts with advocacy. And, um, and I think it's something I get to work a lot with community members, um, either through people who are going through housing struggles or people who are immigrants and things. And this is something that we've done as, as part of that, as when we're leading a workshop um, or even like a, you know, something like informing people about their rights. And this is a really cool activity to do. So yeah, it's really simple. And I hope that some of you did it with me. And if not, maybe, maybe you can do it another time. And yeah, it's just really fun. And it's like I said, it's not about the product, but just about having fun and doing something to get your mind up of whatever. Yeah, whatever you're doing in the moment. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was, I legit had fun doing that and um, mine didn't come out exactly the way that I expected, but it, nonetheless, it was fun. And I'm sure when you all look at yours, you'll be seeing all types of objects <laughs> in your drawing. So thank you for giving us that tool and guiding us through that visual arts activity. You all can connect with Natalie with the info provided on the screen and in the chat box. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Julie Baker, who is the CEO of CA for the Arts since 2018 and has worked to increase the legislative clout and visibility of the arts and culture communities by building coalition across the four and nonprofit sectors of California's creative industries and fighting for resources and legislation to serve and protect artists and cultural workers. She was recently appointed to the board of Creative West, previously known as Western States Arts Federation or WESF. Julie has served as the California State Captain to Americans for the Arts National Arts Action Summit, as well as co-chair of the Creative Economy Working Group at the CA Economic Summit. She is also an appointed member of the State of California's 2022 Entrepreneur and Economic Mobility Task Force in the Creative Economy Working Group under the California Arts Council. So let's welcome Julie. Thank you so much, Nafasha, and thanks to everyone who's here with us today and has been with the um, series of arts and health webinars. I'm going to launch right in since we don't, uh, we want to keep on schedule. So we'll go to the next slide and stop staring at myself. <laughs> Um, just quickly, who are we? Uh, we have two organizations, um, a lobbying organization, California Arts Advocates, where we directly try to influence what's happening in the state legislature in terms of resources and um, public funding and um, cross-sector initiatives to support the thriving arts and culture and creative workforce. On our C3 side, we do things like this, webinars to educate and build advocacy networks for uh, ways, again, to support a, a thriving arts and culture workforce, as well as we produce an annual um, California Arts and Culture Summit and a big activation in April called Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. And all of this, of course, you can check out on our website, um, uh, websites as listed here. Next slide. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about how California for the Arts, California Arts Advocates, sort of interchangeably, have been um, working towards arts and health advocacy uh, and working on it for uh, pretty much the last uh, six, five, six years. And when we look at advocacy, we're going to talk about a little bit about education, socialization, and operationalizing um, how we get towards actually seeing programs and policy shifts uh, in support of arts, the intersection of arts and health. And one of the things I want to also just highlight, part of why we focus on arts and health, uh, beyond all, of course, as Nefesha talked about in the introduction, this has clearly been going on since, um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the history of arts and culture and, and the impact of it on health. But what we see also is an opportunity, and you'll hear this from the other speakers today, on ways that we can also not only legitimize arts work as real work, but also in, impact compensation for artists at um, the do, for the work that they are doing in providing services for our mental health, for um, addressing isolation and loneliness, and um, for overall social determinants of health and public health. So I'm going to go to the next slide. 
This is really just a really quick overview. There's a lot more information that our um, organization provides, including trainings as we go towards Advocacy Day in April, as well as a number of other programs. But when you think about advocacy and you're thinking about how do I get maybe uh, an arts and health initiative um, in my community, some of the things that you might wanna think about are plan your campaign. So what are your goals? What are you trying to change? What are the targets for that? Who are you, you know, for whom are you doing this in terms of, you know, in our case, it's really, again, around arts and culture workers, right? And making sure that there are the resources for thriving. And part of the way that we see this is, is the impact of um, compensation and um, validation of the work in arts and health. And about identifying the resources, identify your partners. You also need to think about who might be in opposition to, to what you're trying to achieve. Because maybe, you know, uh, you want to address them directly and try and bring them into your coalition and try to minimize that. Or you need to be prepared for um, the messaging to, to address the opposition. And know the process. Be informed. Who are the decision makers? Who are you trying to influence? Then you're going to get into designing um, and creating awareness. You're going to think about your uh, key messages utilizing data and storytelling. And I think you've seen over these last several series that we, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of storytelling around how arts um, is uh, critical to our um, to the benefits of, of a healthy life. And, and then you want to determine the strategy. How are you going to do this? How are you going to, um, what are the tactics? Uh, next slide. Um, and then, you know, ways some of the uh, tactics can be, you know, generating engagement, maybe sharing your advocacy toolkit, using social media, getting others to share the message, finding those other key partners that have influence that might be not directly in your network, but outside of your network, in our case, like public health, um, and asking them to also um, be, uh, uh, you know, ambassadors for the message. And then encouraging actions. What is the ask? What are you, you know, trying to achieve directly at the end of this um, campaign? And then you also at times have to read the room. Is this the time to be aggressive? Is this the time to be socializing and educating instead? Or is this the time to really try to implement um, something at this moment in time? And finally, you know, sustaining momentum and advocacy is critical. And you'll see this in the course of what I'm presenting and how long we've been working on this. But organizing, showing up, being consistent, being flexible because, you know, I don't think any of us had COVID in our strategic plan. So you have really, we've all learned that we have to be flexible and resilient. And then finally, being hopeful. Don't give up. Uh, you know, I think if you truly believe that you can affect this change, I think we all say this to ourselves, to our children, to our communities, we can do this if we put our minds to it. So uh, next slide. Just want to highlight some of the things, again, that we've been doing. And a lot of this is beginning the education the key messages, the socialization of um, what is, you know, the impact of arts to our health. So um, the Artists Are Second Responders was a, a campaign that we have used over the time period that we've been thinking about this. Um, it was actually coined by Kristen Madsen, in, um, at formerly of um, uh, Creative Sonoma, um, in response to the fires that was there, uh, that happened there. Um, and so she said, you know, artists are our second responders. They're the ones not taking you out of the burning building, but when you come out of that burning building, they're the ones who are helping to, um, uh, to give you life again, right? And uh, some people challenge second responders. Many artists, cultural bearers have said to me, no, we are the first responders totally respect that in the context, and this is reading the room, of the work that we do working inside systems of government, trying to influence public policy. First responders are very specific categories. So we, we want to uh, highlight um, artists are the second responders. And so these are some of the campaigns that we've done over the time. Um, next slide. You can see also our branding has shifted. Um, in 2020, of course, we all know what was going on in 2020, and artists were really being looked to as um, providers of um, helping us to get through this really difficult time, right? This was a new moment in history that we didn't know how to manage. And so we started really leaning into um, addressing that and talking about how this is essential work, right? We were way down the um, uh 
period of when we would reopen, um, but in yet artists were continuing to do the things, moving online, helping people through it. And so again, we got a lot of press coverage around that. We wrote op-eds around artists or second responders. And this is part of our advocacy, building the education and the socialization of this concept, um, education mostly in this case, of artists um, in, in understanding what their contributions are to our communities and to our health. Next slide. Um, in 2020, we also started doing online presentations. We were meant to do in 2020 an in-person summit. We had a shift to online. We did some webinars, which you can access um, in um, uh, the links that you'll receive after this. And you can see some of the folks uh, on the right side of the screen that we highlighted back in 2020, who've now returned Alan Siegel. Dr. Siegel was one of the first people we uh, featured in this arts and webinar series. Next slide. In 2021, we continued this conversation with some special guests around the idea of intersection of arts and, like what is, you know, arts and, how do we, what else does arts um, uh, uh, impact? And then we also were able to get a Senate concurrent resolution declaring not only um, April, every April is Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month, but that artists uh, play a significant role as second responders in our state. So again, that's the socialization. Now we've got the legislators using this language and the light bulb moment goes off, right? That's right. They are providing this level of essential service. So these are some of the tactics we've been using over the time period to get us to where we're going to be now. Next slide. I want to be mindful of time. These are just some, we worked closely uh, with the USC um, Keck School uh, of Medicine on some how to be reopening the arts safely. That was a big piece of that. And also talking about how we were very focused on health and wellness, not only of our own staff and people that were the artists that we work with, but also the audiences. Next slide. Uh, again, 2022, we continue to really lean into what is art work, right? Arts work too. And in this case, we did a whole webinar on the arts work to heal. And you can see some of the folks that you've probably seen over the years, Dr. Jill Sankey, Dr. Golden, um, Ping Ho, and Trevor uh, Davis from Reach in LA, who's been also really working uh, on issues like this. And, and we were featured um, and a number of us in a webinar there. Next slide. 2023, we were grateful to Music Man Foundation, who's put a lot of effort into understanding the correlation of music to um, health as well, and to supporting initiatives like this. Next slide. And one of our own priorities in, in terms of our strategic priorities of um, what we what we focus on uh, in terms of building content, uh, uh, both in, in things like this, but also in our public um, policy priorities is health. So that is that is something that we have now made a, a strategic decision around that we as an organization will focus on. Next slide. And as well as, oh, I failed to mention also, we just are finishing up an analysis of a 1600 uh, person uh, survey that people responded to that our field engagement team did. And one of the main priorities and the fi findings and policy priorities is diversify and increase sources of funding for arts through cross sector initiatives, which of course health would be categorized in. Next slide. Uh, this last year or this year, gosh, we're still in 2024, we had a great panel, um, which I, I really recommend you review. And we've had wonderful collaboration with um, Bay Area Video Coalition and um, uh, around uh, making these presentations available for you on our YouTube channel. And uh, you'll see an incredible panel moderated by uh, the amazing Deborah Cullinan around, again, arts on prescription and arts and health. Uh, so now we're starting to really continue not only the education and socialization in the legislature with the administration, but also to the field. What is arts on prescription? How can you start to do this? So that's where we're continuing our advocacy. Next slide. Um, and when uh, 2024, at the end of 2023, we hired Jennifer, who's been amazing at putting together a number of things, including this webinar series. Uh, we're going to have additional resource materials that we're combining on what is arts and health. So you can really easily access that with all the sorts of resources to that. And next year's summit um, is uh, going to focus on artwork as real work with an emphasis on health, healing, and hope. And also just put a shout out that we're always looking for sponsors. So if you're in a position to sponsor um, our summit and our advocacy day, please uh, contact Nefesha. Uh, next slide. 
And, you know, Arts and Health webinar series has been really, really well received, um, which shows that there is interest. And again, this is helpful in terms of our advocacy and understanding kind of like who's out there, who's interested in this, and how do we continue to lean into this as a priority and a policy priority. So you can see how many people have tuned in and registered. You know, I think all of us who do um, series online have seen over the years that these numbers that continue to decrease, people are kind of burnt on being on Zoom all day long. So seeing an average of 350 people register for a webinar is really an indication that this is a key issue and priority for a lot of people. And we've had people tuning in from all over uh, the, the world, really, uh, for our webinar series. So again, that's really wonderful work by Jennifer and Nefesha and the programs team at California for the Arts. Next slide. Sorry if I'm speaking quickly uh, and trying to get uh, stay on time. Um, in 2024, so we had that great panel. Then we took those experts and we were able to set up a meeting with some of the folks in the Newsom administration around the arts and health intersection and specifically around the concept of arts on prescription, which I know you've heard in the webinar series. And if you're not familiar with arts on prescription, there's many, many resources specifically to that. And then we started to talk about it in our legislative meeting. So again, this is the trajectory of our specific advocacy. And we start thinking about, okay, what are the ways that we can influence through legislation, some of the things or through activities within the legislature. So for example, looking at creative arts therapies licensure, which does not exist in the state of California, looking at a potential hearing with the Joint Committee on Arts, with, around arts and health. And again, uh, these are continued strategies for us to build advocacy so that we can get to a place where artists and cultural bearers are seen as arts workers for health, are seen as part of the solution, are compensated for that work. Next slide. Um, we're also looking and working actively currently right now on an arts and prescription pilot program. Um, so we'll continue to keep people uh, informed if that continues to build. We've had now some really terrific collaborations with government relations folks who are actually specifically lobbyists in public health who also believe in the intersection of arts and health. So we continue to build now the coalition to be outside of the arts, but getting others involved in that. As of course, we've seen in the newer arts and, um, and with neuroscientists that's happening in the science realm. Now we wanna see this really in the public policy realm. So getting more folks talking about this, not just the arts people talking about, it. And looking at access to arts participation recognizes a social determinant of health, which I know uh, Kristen has, will be talking a little bit about that as well. There's specific public policy intervention, interventions we can be looking at too. Medicaid waivers to address health-related social needs that could include the arts. And looking at um, the that there is actually pending legislation from Assemblymember Shirley Weber right now uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Akila Weber, that is around requiring healthcare service plans to cover screenings for social determinants of health. So that's actually, I think, on the governor's desk right now. And you can see all of this, again, um, links to articles, and you will get these um, decks so you can do more research on your own. So again, you can see the trajectory of what we've been doing over the last four years to really build towards public policy interventions. And this is our work because we do it at the state level, but at the same time, what we're hoping we're doing is inspiring and educating um, other folks, empowering you with the tools to be able to advocate within your own community for this. And some of the things that we're thinking about in phase two of this series would be workshops online, potentially, and some in person, where we're really helping to build that advocacy uh, toolkit with your own community, assessing the landscape, who are the people doing this in your community, so that you can continue to um, build that um, um, uh, opportunity for artists and cultural bearers and arts organizations in, in the communities uh, in which you live and work. Uh, next slide. I think I did it. So uh, that's kind of um, it. Again, I'm just here to provide a big overview of kind of how you, how California for the Arts and California Arts Advocates has built an advocacy framework for this work. But at the same time, hopefully, um, if you're in, interested in doing this in your own community, you're going to hear some local uh, stories um, coming up now. But you're also hopefully uh, are coming up soon. You also um, feel free to reach out to us and say, I'm really interested in advocating for this. I need more help. I need more support. I need more tools. 
and we would be delighted to work uh, with, alongside you to make this happen. Thanks. Thank you, Julie, for your presentation. It's incredible to hear all of the efforts California for the Arts have been doing in the past few years. And I'm thankful to be along this journey with you all moving forward. Uh, so for our next speaker, I'd like to welcome Julia Hotz, who is a solutions-focused journalist based in New York. Her stories have appeared in the New York Times, Wired, Scientific American, the Boston Globe, and Time, just to name a few. And she's helped other journalists report on big ideas changing the world at Solutions Journalism Network. The Connection Cure is her first book, which chronicles the science stories and spread of social prescribing. It highlights the prescriptive power of movement, nature, art, service, and belonging. Julia uses a combination of diligent science reporting, moving patient uh, success stories, and surprising self-discovery to help readers find lasting and life-changing medicine in their own communities. The Connection Cure offers a path to systematic change. And thank you, Julia, for joining us today. Ooh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Julie, for kicking that off. That was just awesome. Um, I'm in New York today where we've just kicked off our UNGA Healing Arts Week. And there was a lot of praise given to California and California for the Arts for being such a national leader in recognizing arts as such a powerful intervention for our health, our healthcare, our schools, and our general well-being. Um, so I want to talk in this limited time today just a little bit about the stakes we have here in the United States, what I've learned um, about social prescribing, particularly arts prescribing in reporting this book, The Connection Cure, because um, I got to tell you, the number one question I get when I'm talking about social prescribing to people who've never heard about it before is, how is this going to work in the United States? We have a healthcare system that's so focused on treating the symptoms. We have a healthcare system that, you know, has incentives to treat these symptoms. And how might the world look like if we were to be able to prescribe the arts the same way we prescribe pills and therapies? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we can go to this first slide. You know, the book starts from this standpoint of we live in a system of diagnose, treat, repeat. Whoops, there we go. And what do I mean by that? Um, I think when we grow up in the United States, you know, some of our first interactions with healthcare are, let's say we get strep throat, right? We get strep throat, we go to the doctor, the doctor tells us, does a test, says we have strep throat, gives us an antibiotic. And that's sort of our relationship to healthcare from the very beginning. The problem is though, as we get older, our health and our healthcare gets more complicated. Not all of the ailments, especially the ailments that are on the rise in the United States, have these simple diagnoses, have these simple treatments and are able to be repeated. So what do I mean by that? If we go to the first slide here, just a high level look at the stats. Um, about 39% of Americans have at least one major chronic disease. Chronic meaning long lasting, chronic meaning not acute. Unlike strep throat, a simple antibiotic is not gonna cut it. In the world, we have an estimated 50% of people who are estimated to develop a mental health disorder in their lifetime. This has been especially on the rise ever since COVID. One in five adults diagnosed with a mental disorder. I heard a new stat today, 30% of adults reported symptoms of anxiety or depression. A hundred of thousand Americans died from preventable drug overdoses in 2021 alone. That's a 781% increase since 1999. And of course, there's we're seeing a big, powerful conversation around kids. We're seeing one in nine kids and adults were diagnosed with ADHD in 2024. So don't worry, it's going to get more optimistic from here. But it's no surprise that 90% of Americans who are polled believe that we have a mental health crisis. And even for those who don't have a formal disorder, more of us are feeling stressed, lonely. This word languishing has been really trending ever since the pandemic, this sort of blah state of we're not really sick, but we're not really well either. So this is part of the problem, right? We are seeing these diagnoses are on the rise. 
So what do we do about that? Next slide. Um, well, we, we get treatments, right? And um, the 2023 stat suggests 70% of U.S. adults are taking at least one prescription medication per day. That's up 14 percentage points since 2019. We're seeing 24% of Americans take four or more prescription drugs. And um, of the people who receive these prescriptions, actually a lot of them are coming from primary care. We're seeing that Americans are uniquely kind of have, have this response uniquely. Americans spend more on top selling drugs than the rest of the world combined. Um, next slide, please. Now, I want to be careful about this because I do believe that pharmaceutical prescriptions are absolutely the solution for some of these folks. This is not a call to take that option off the menu, but it is a call to pay attention to the way that the United States uniquely is attached to this solution. We are the only nation besides New Zealand that allows for pharmaceuticals to directly um, advertise to consumers. And we see pharmaceuticals spend, this is a low estimate, $6 billion a year on ads. Just imagine for all the folks I'm reading about in the chat, people who are working in local communities to spread the word about arts as, um, you know, as medicine. Imagine if you had that budget. <laughs> um, so this has been our model, right? Diagnose, treat, repeat. But if we go to the next slide, we'll see that this model is breaking. And this was the impetus for me to start writing my book in 2020. Um, we've seen that, you know, the the prime the care providers um are not able to meet to to <laughs> sorry to meet demand um we're seeing emergency rooms are overcrowding we're seeing hospitals are closing particularly children's boards we're seeing mental health related emergency department visits are on the rise and this is particularly true in places that are already facing sort of socioeconomic um um inequities so that's just healthcare facilities. But if we go to the next slide, we'll see that the health workers in those facilities are increasingly burning out or they're leaving the profession or they're not entering the profession to begin with. By 2034, we're estimated to be short 124,000 physicians, 275,000 nurses, and 195,000 social workers. Among this too, we're seeing our physicians, right? The primary people who we see for these increasingly common ailments like anxiety, depression, they're gonna be 65 or older within the next decade. So they're aging out. And of those physicians who remain, up to 50% of them report burnout. And there was this wild study they did, um, I believe at the University of Chicago, where they estimated that for primary care doctors to do everything they're supposed to do, in an average day in terms of acute care, preventative care, administrative duties, all this, it would take them 26.7 hours per day. And of course we know that we only have 24 and there's also sleep and work-life balance and all this. So it's no wonder they're reporting feeling burnt out and um, more as well are reporting moral injury, right? This idea that, you know, we're seeing these increasing, um, you know, just sort of disillusionment with the profession. People want to be able to prescribe the arts. People want to be able to prescribe more holistic healing modalities, but the system just doesn't set them up for that. Um, so let me go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm going so quickly. We just have a lot to get through. <laughs> we know, like I said earlier, the full story on pill prescriptions is complicated. Um, the book talks a little bit more in depth about this, but while antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications are certainly a solution for some people, they're not a solution for everybody all of the time. Next slide, please. So this is where social prescribing comes in. This is a practice through which health workers can prescribe non-medical community resources and activities the same way they're prescribing pills and therapies. Next slide, please. And I really appreciated, um, you know, Nefesh's introduction in the beginning about how these ideas of arts as a healing modality are are ancient. They're age old. They're brought past to us from indigenous wisdom. Um, so this is not here new, right? This idea that arts can be very healing for 
trauma and symptoms of depression and anxiety. Next slide, please. Um, but what is new is that we're seeing more and more empirical evidence around this. This one study alone talks about just 45 minutes of art making significantly reduced people's cortisol levels. Um, next slide, please. And I want to talk about this in the context of somebody I had the pleasure to interview for this book. This person's name is Kuhn. She is from Australia. When I meet her, she is just so full of life and um, clearly an ambassador of the art. She's got this funky outfit on, this Pokemon tattoo. Um, and she tells me that she's an artist, but she also happens to tell me that for most of her life, she was a trauma story. She grew up in an environment where um, she faced terrible abuse from her parents. Um, she was the daughter of Vietnamese refugees who they themselves were sort of passing down this generational trauma. And she never had the chance to really just be a kid, right? And this manifests later in her life as severe depression, as her leaving the workplace on psychological injury. Um, and she says, you know, I, I really didn't believe I could do, I could do anything because that's what I grew up believing. That's what my parents told me. Anytime I tried to be creative, I just had this really cruel inner voice telling me I was always doing something wrong. So Kuhn gets prescribed a spot in a, um, a program called Makeshift, an eight week creative arts workshop that's actually funded by the government to help incentivize people to go back to work. But the facilitators of that workshop were really, really intent on saying, listen, we can't force people to go back to work. Let's first focus on getting people to come back to life. And so that's exactly what this workshop does. It's exposing people like Kuhn to watercolor painting, to gardening, to storytelling, all of these creative mediums. And you'll have to read the book to get the full story, but the Spark Notes version is that Kuhn, you know, talks about the way that this dramatically improved her relationships. It gave her confidence. It gave her more joy. And ultimately she did end up going back to work. And I, um, I know we're out of time, so I'll just close with this quote from Kuhn who says, I thought I was just so broken and damaged, but I've realized there's more out there that I can do. Um, so thank you so much. I'd love, I could talk all day about this stuff, but all this to say the work you are doing to bring arts to your communities, to spread the power of the arts, to get this as not just a nice to have, but an integral part about how we do policy, healthcare, schools is so important for people like Kuhn and so many more. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia, for that presentation. Really, really appreciated that. And um, I am actually in New York also, and I'll be at the Hill Arts uh, event this, week, th this evening, and hopefully we can run into it. Um, it's very informative to hear about the summary of the U.S. healthcare model, and your book is easy to follow along and provides wonderful insights. And also thank you for sharing that we're being spoken of the work that we're doing here in California, in New York, and it's expanding. So thank you for that. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker for today, Kristen Sakota, who is the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, the local arts agency with a mission to advance arts, culture, and creativity throughout the most populous county in the U.S. Kristen is an arts executive attorney and performing artist with over 25 years in the field. As an artist, she appeared on stage around the world, including with dance and social justice company, Urban Bushwoman in Rent and Mamma Mia on Broadway. She holds a Juris Doctorate from NYU School of Law with honors in entertainment law and a BA from Stanford University with a specialization in race and ethnicity and secondary major in feminist studies. Thank you, Kristen, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an incredible uh, day and opportunity to come together and an incredible topic, of course, that reaches all of our lives and an incredible uh, group of folks to be here with. So very happy to be here. And thanks to you and Julie Baker and everybody for including me in this conversation. 
So I'm going to highlight some of the work that we've been doing in Los Angeles County as a way really just to show additional strategies, how we're thinking of the work, um, and share ideas and um, tactics even that you might want to employ in your work or that really can just help us think through the myriad ways um, to address some of these issues that are at the intersection of arts and health. So we can go to the next slide. So for this work, uh, as was noted, our mission is nice and big and broad. And many of you may know that we are both uh, sort of a young and an old uh, entity in that our roots are back from 1947 when the LA County Board of Supervisors created the LA County Music Commission. And so our roots were always in access to the arts, specifically in music. And later, fast forward a long time later um, in 2018, when uh, I joined as executive director, the Board of Supervisors had been considering creating the first ever Department of Arts and Culture. And so I was reappointed as the director and we were able to create a new Department of Arts and Culture to really formalize the idea that the public sector absolutely has a role in supporting arts and culture as part of quality of life for all of its communities. And so here you see our refreshed uh, and imagined mission and vision. And now we do this work still alongside appointed arts commissioners and incredible staff and so many partners and colleagues like everybody here today. Next slide. And I like to uplift um, part, uh, you know, as part of policy and how we think about this work, but part uh, to speak to advocacy, as Julie Baker was sharing, I like to actually uplift why we invest in the arts, um, no matter where we sit, public sector, private sector, but especially for the public sector, what are some of those reasons? And we do this because we know that the arts contribute to quality of life and a, across a whole range of policy areas, from education to our youth, to enlivening civic spaces, to supporting our health and well-being and healthy communities all around. We know that actually uh, arts and culture contributes to healthy communities so much that we've seen incredible research over the years that shows how much it benefits us as individuals, our own mental well-being, creative expression, our own skill building, but also that communities that have more cultural resources have better outcomes in things like public health, uh, in public safety or educational attainment in that community. So think about that. That means that even if you didn't engage, you didn't go to the dance program, you didn't go to theater, as a community, as a collective, you are going to have better outcomes in health and well-being if there are cultural resources, more artists, more organizations, more programs, more venues in your community. And this was shown to especially be true for low-income communities that may be culture-rich even if they have been uh, disinvested and historically excluded from resources. And that comes from incredible research like the Social Impact of the Arts Project, SIAP, out of University of Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see that running throughout our work. We also know the arts are a core part of our economy, especially in Los Angeles County and the state of California, where it's a $200 billion annual output and activity for LA County alone um, in this work. Of course, arts and culture are also an opportunity to drive social change, build empathy, address the crisis of social um, inclusion that our Surgeon General has talked about, promote greater belonging, and really help us bridge across communities and cultures and support our own sense of identity. And of course, as we're talking about today, proven to support health and well-being and recovery. And we'll talk more. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that has been shown to be true, not only sort of in cultural practices from time immemorial, as was spoken about earlier, but more and more has been documented in the true sort of health context, both as prevention of, of issues, as a form of recovery from and out of, uh, as a form of healing, whether it's mental health and trauma or whether it's physical healing um, and folks being able to breathe better when they do singing exercises, because singing actually helps your blood flow and your, and your breath capacity, but even coming out of things like long COVID, um, but also uh, just broader well, well-being for all. And so in all of this, if we understand that arts and culture is not only an incredible sector, it's not only a form of entertainment, but it is also a public good, then we know that expanding access to arts and culture is key to equity and addressing having a multiracial democracy where everyone thrives.
Next slide. So one of the things that we have had the opportunity to do in Los Angeles County um, is, and yeah, you can go to the next slide on social determinants of health, is to really think about this intersection across all of our work. And so in that, I wanna just highlight, Julie Baker spoke on this already, but I'll just briefly highlight in this past year, we did a lot of work with the LA County Department of uh, Public Health to talk about the opportunity for arts to continue to make positive impact across the social determinants of health, which are often thought of as five domains that significantly affect the conditions where people live, where we work, where we play, and significantly can impact in a positive or negative way our health outcomes. And in fact, some people believe that it is even a stronger driver where you live, literally that zip code, that community, where you live, work, and play can have such an effect um, that some people believe it's actually even a stronger driver than uh, your own sort of personal daily choices of what did I choose to eat for lunch? Uh, you know, did I go to the gym? I would say it's a both and, but we know that these are the huge meta structures around us as well as the uh, interplay. And so arts can affect our economic opportunities with the creative economy or skill building, um, can of course positively impact education, but also healthcare access and quality. How many times are we now hearing about the importance of more culturally relevant health services and trying to continue to eliminate bias in healthcare services, but also promoting and expanding what we think of as health and care and non-traditional um, services and programs through the arts. Our neighborhoods, having thriving neighborhoods, having a built environment that is designed architecturally for inclusion, and of course, just the social and community contexts in which we live. Next slide. So in LA County, I will just say a couple of years ago, about two, three years ago, one of our grantee organizations called LA Opera approached me to say that they had been having some great conversations based on the work they do around music and health and some of the programs and singing uh, opportunities they had been providing. And they realized there was a bigger there there. And they wanted to engage in a broader conversation on arts and health and reached out to me at Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture to see if we could partner with them. That turned into what we've now done a three times as a third annual Los Angeles County Arts and Health Summit convened by LA Opera in partnership with LA County Arts and Culture, but also the World Health Organization and the incredible ambassador for arts and health at WHO, Renee Fleming, the noted uh, soprano. We've also had the engagement of our elected officials. Supervisor Hilda Solis has done a motion each year to proclaim it LA County Arts and Health Week and uplift this visibility, and it's a way to bring folks together. So as we began to, to lean deeper into this work, I looked anew at all the work we do across our local arts agency, whether it's in grant making, arts education, civic art commissions, or other work at the intersection of arts and other sectors, and again highlighted ways that we could intentionally speak to the intersection of arts and health. And I wanna first just say though, we know that this is an interesting time because everything that expands access and engagement in the arts contributes to people's health and well-being. So in some ways, everything we all do supports arts and health. But here I'm gonna highlight things where there's a more sort of intentional and maybe more direct connection in our work. Um, and I think I might have a slide. This is sort of an overview of highlighting. I think I have a slide on each of these, but I can't remember. Can you go to the next slide for me? Okay, yes. Um, and I did want to just acknowledge on that last slide, you may have seen, I didn't say, there, say her name out loud, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson came and gave a keynote at one of the summits. And I also uh, had conversations with health leaders from LA County. So conversation with Dr. Barbara Ferrer, who you might have seen on TV a lot during COVID as we came out of COVID uh, with our director of mental health and with aging and disability disabilities and so on, as well as artists. So next slide, thank you. So one of the ways that we are engaging in arts and health is through our civic art practice, where we commission original artworks for county facilities and civic spaces. I wanna highlight that we believe that art not only beautifies, but this is a way to make spaces where the public and our communities come to get services, including health, 
make them feel more inclusive, make them feel more welcoming and actually reflect the cultures and the heritage of the folks in our community. What you're looking at here is this incredible artist, Floyd Strickland, who we were able to commission right from the local neighborhood of the now uh, Jacqueline Avant Child and Wellness uh, Center, where they treat many children and families, especially those with developmental disabilities. His gorgeous paintings are in the space where youth and their families are often waiting for their appointments. It's outfit with small little tables and chairs for them to play, and these huge larger than life paintings that feature children in the neighborhood in super hyper realistic painting, including um, children with developmental disabilities. Gorgeous, gorgeous work. But we also know, and I want to uplift some data from Americans for the Arts from a few years back, that this is not only a broader sense of inclusion and welcome and vibrancy, this is real health. They did a study that showed that if people had some kind of illness uh, or injury and would have to have a multi-night stay in a hospital, that you are likely to recover up to one day faster if you could see art or nature from your hospital room. So you think about what that means about the power of arts and nature for our well-being or recovery. And as a policy and advocacy point, that is return on investment. Because trust me, investing in artists, investing in art in all of our wellness facilities and our health and our hospital and recovery sites is going to be a much lower cost than funding the cost of having people stay an extra day, millions of people all across this country. So we want to continue to uplift the visibility of that work through the art itself, but also the narrative and the data. Next slide. We've also used, utilized civic art as a way to heal. Um, and there's all kinds of versions of this. This one I will just uh, try to briefly highlight. When I first arrived, LA County supervisors uh, led by Supervisor Solis, but they all voted to actually acknowledge and apologize for the historic practices in county hospitals of coerced sterilization. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up. It's happened unfortunately around the world and around the country. It's where women, typically women thought of as more undesirable, women of color, women who didn't speak English and didn't know what the doctors were saying, women with disabilities might come in for a pregnancy uh, or to give birth or something else. And they come out the other side having been either coerced into or not even told that the doctors chose for them to sterilize them so they could never have children again. An incredibly harmful practice that as you can see was intensely uh, filled with bias. In LA County, the supervisors wanted to apologize and they said, well, we wanna commemorate it with a plaque or some other work and they tasked us to work with the hospital. The hospital administration was wonderful and my civic art team, we commissioned an artist named Fung Huynh, she's phenomenal. She did deep community engagement work with women and families that were directly affected. There was a whole documentary about the work. We talked to the lawyers, um, Antonio Hernandez, who actually fought this case at the time and then created this work that is court and steel to represent the resiliency of these women. But it is also a lot of sort of Mexican and Latin influence because many of them were Spanish speaking women that shows the beauty and their love and around it, their exact words that they said, which is if you speak English, they treat you one way. If you speak Spanish, they treat you another way. And then we had a huge opportunity for hospital leadership to say never again. And we are on the path to healing and justice with the community. So speaking of femme empowerment and healing from trauma through art. Next slide. We also have a huge division in arts education and youth development. And so just briefly, I will say we believe in access to the arts and we know it's proven for better outcomes for youth, skill building, health, creative expression in school. And so we do advancement grants for school districts, but also we are prioritizing youth that have been impacted by the foster care system and the justice system, because sometimes trauma is not equitably distributed. And so we have been working with partners like the Arts for Healing and Justice Network and many of their organizations, as well as getting funding from other county departments, probation, state funding, juvenile justice, crime prevention act funding, mental health funding, and that into a modality that invests in and coordinates arts organizations to bring teaching artists with healing centered arts engagement, prioritizing youth that are systems impacted, both those in foster care through a program called creative well being and in the justice system and as a prevention mechanism in parks and other community settings to hopefully keep young people out of these systems in the first place. Next slide. 
I'll also just highlight that as we look deeper at something we call creative well-being, this is uh, one that, as I mentioned, really prioritizes foster youth in schools and other community settings, also foster group homes. Um, but we've also realized that it's not only the young people, we can use professional development that is arts-based with the adults who care for the youth. So we have served over 20,000 adults, y'all, who are social workers, educators, mental health practitioners, foster uh, leaders, and others to give them self-care, but also teach them about the healing role of the arts. And we just did actually a big program evaluation, so happy to share that soon. Next slide, and I think I probably only have hopefully a couple more. Okay, it was developed collaboratively. Next slide. With several organizations, you may know these partners, they are phenomenal and doing phenomenal work. And I still feel like there might be one other piece there. There's also a curriculum guide for you to check out. Next slide. Yes, working with youth and adults. Next slide. Oh, and I will have to mention grant making. So many of your organizations do this incredible work at the intersection, whether it's uh, Dance for Pete Parkinson's, like in Vertigo Dance, Critical Mass Dance Company, which does work with survivors of sexual violence. And so funding hundreds of organizations is an important part of arts advocacy and health. And next slide is the last one, justice. We are doing a form of referrals, kind of a form of social prescribing, but in the re-entry system. So folks coming out of the justice system who can ask for healing and other kind of arts programs for them and their families. It's an incredible program um, partnering with arts orgs. And looking ahead, which is where I wanna land on all of this work, and this supports uh, Julie's comments about advocacy. We did a, um, uh, a statement jointly uh, with myself and the director of public health. And a lot of what it's based on is World Health Organization. They did a scoping review of hundreds of studies and they, this is in 2019, and they found that absolutely there are direct connections between arts and health, health prevention, health promotion. But what they cited the problem was, the challenge was the next opportunity for all of us is that we need to raise the visibility of this work. We need to raise the value of arts as part of health promotion. And we need more collaborations and integration of the arts into our health systems and our other civic systems and communities. That is really the work that's left to do. So thank you so much. I'm sure I went over time, um, but thank you so much and I appreciate being here. Thank you so much for your presentation, Kristen. You're all doing amazing work in LA County and we look forward to hearing more about what's to come. So now I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today, Nicole Taylor, who is a soprano teaching artist and the CEO and founder of Creativity Through Music LLC. Originally from LA, Nicole is a graduate of the master's program at the Juilliard School in New York. Uh, as a cultural envoy for the US Department of State since 2010, she has traveled through Europe and the Middle East, offering concerts, master classes, and educational outreach programs with the aim of promoting understanding and building intercultural bridges. Nicole is also the California Creative Corps Artist in Residence for Ventura County. And in this role, she has worked with the Ventura uh, County Offices of Arts and Culture and DEI and the VC Family Justice Center. Thank you, Nicole, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for the invitation. It's really an honor to uh, be able to uh, speak amongst such a a wonderful panel. Julie, you're always so supportive. I love you. Um, Julia, we've never met, but I, your book is absolutely on my reading list. Thank you for developing this amazing resource for the creative sector and for artists like myself. And Kristen, we've met before. I think you're amazing as well. And the Arts and Health Summit was really um, a wonderful event. I really enjoyed uh, meeting and hearing uh, from all of the speakers that were there over that week. And I would just like to speak to you a little bit about my background. I'd like to speak to you about um, some projects that I'm working on currently and um, where I see myself and my company going in the future. So we can go ahead and bring up the slides. Nicole, you should be able to see the slide. I 
I'm on speaker view, but for some reason it's not showing them on my side, but that's okay. I have them here on my computer, so. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I am, in my background, I'm a classical singer and I, I work in arts education as a teaching artist. That means everything from being a performer on a stage to um, teaching privately one-on-one -on -one, to for many years uh, teaching in a corporation, working with employees on uh, team building and resilience through music, as well as my work that has already been described a bit um, as an arts envoy with the State Department. And it's given me a really interesting perspective and a knowledge base about uh, working with designing and executing various kinds of art, arts programming, outreach for the individual, for individuals at the relational level. So that means, you know, community partners, community organizations, as well as at the systemic level um, and at an international scale in many countries and many, with many different kinds of groups of people, everything from ministers of culture to uh, working with um, people who've uh, survived bombings to uh, developing programming for youth in the West Bank over the course of a year and a half to um, uh, music conservatories and everything in between. So I have this really broad knowledge that for me for a long time seemed a bit disconnected. Um, I have worked in business, government, education, nonprofit sector, creative sector, and a bit in the health sector as well. And it seemed disconnected until the pandemic. Now, once the pandemic started uh, and ended, I was forced to kind of reinvent myself as an artist. You know, things were, I was living in Europe at the time. I lived in France for many years and I needed to return home. Um, you know, my business folded from one day to the next and I came back home. I started working for a, for a startup and uh, continued to do some arts integration and creativity training with them. But I knew that there was something else for me. And so a dear friend gave me some great advice and he told me to take everything that I already do and put it under one umbrella. And it was really uh, the best advice that I think I have ever received because out of this was born my company, Creativity Through Music. So um, I work in cultural consulting, creative strategies, as you can see, uh, community-based, uh, arts-based community outreach, curriculum development, cultural diplomacy, cultural events, corporate creativity, artist deployment, and many other things. And all of these things are related. And um, I absolutely love what I do. I still consider myself to be a professional performing artist. However, I'm using exactly those skills in a different environment, in different domains and working with different groups of people. But the fulfillment is the same because the skill set is actually the same. I would say that my mission and the thing that brings me joy through this work is um, bringing the arts where they are not or amplifying them where they are. And some of the projects that I've been working on um, recently since moving to Ventura County, which is where I'm based, are um, Arts at the Table. This is a series of panel discussions which looks at why we should have artists planted in the various sectors of our community. There's the Reframe um, Ventura County Summit. This was the first art summit of its kind in Ventura County that was really business forward, looking at arts on entrepreneurship and professional development um, for artists here in our community. And it was a wonderful experience to collaborate with a lot of different um, arts leaders here for in Ventura County. 
I have also developed the Oxnard Performing Arts Center Arts and Schools Pilot Program. Um, and this, this was an adventure. This program was funded by the California Arts Council and we served over 2000 high school aged youth, most of whom had not had an arts class since the fourth grade. Um, the programming was in six different schools. And while we've started with California Arts Council funding, we are folding over, folding forward into Prop 28 funding. So it's been a really uh, wonderful bridge. And then of course, there's the California Creative Core. The project that I focused on was with the County of Ventura Arts and Culture, DEI office, and the Ventura County Family Justice Center. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, current and uh, upcoming um, uh, projects, there's the Voices Youth Art Exhibit, which is the first of its kind here in the County of Ventura. And it's a collaboration between my company, Oxnard Performing Arts Center, the County of Ventura Arts and Culture Office, and Ventura County Arts Council, and integrates um, large, 22 large scale collaborative artworks. The largest one is eight by 16 feet that were developed by these wonderful um, high school students looking at um, themes like uh, community patterns and identity and trauma and healing through collaborative art. So there were 700 youth roughly who participated in the, the creation of these works. And the goal is for this exhibit, the Voices exhibit to travel throughout Ventura County. So it's been in the hall of administration at the seat of our government for the past two months. And next, hopefully it's going to the Ventura County Office of Education. Um, we have the One County, One Book Festival, which is a collaboration between the County Ventura Library System as well as Cal State University Channel Islands. And I will be leading two um, arts-based arts workshops. One is uh, with a colleague of mine that's uh, focused on collaborative poetry. And then the second one will be taking that poetry and creating a collaborative work of art, which will be featured at the One County, One Book uh, Festival in October. There's the Youth Justice Action Month Resource and Job Fair. We'll be bringing some arts activities uh, to this program in October. That's with the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission. And then lastly, and most importantly, there is the Ventura County Behavioral Health Arts and Wellness Program, which is the first arts prescription program in Ventura County. Um, I can't see the slide, so I'm gonna say next slide. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the California Creative Corps. Uh, most of you are probably familiar, but if you're not, in the area where I live, they formed the Central Coast Creative Corps. So the Arts Councils from six different counties combined their, um, their efforts together and they selected uh, 23 artists. Six artists were from Ventura County or six artists and artist groups were from Ventura County and I was one of them. And we were hired and our, uh, whereas the community partners that we worked with were the grantees. So that was a wonderful experience for those of us who had the opportunity to participate. It was a one-year collaboration uh, for me with the County of Ventura Arts and Culture Office, DEI, and uh, Ventura County Family Justice Center with a focus on cultural consulting, arts innovation, and the development of creative strategies. So for me, um, the problem was, or the problem to be solved, was bringing together um, arts activities and creative experiences which would be relevant to survivors of violent crime, who are the clients of the Ventura County Family Justice Center, as well as uh, survivors and staff. I also was tasked with publicizing the services that the Family Justice Center pr provides and building trust in the community. Um, and to celebrate the opening of the new Family Justice Center, which will be at some point in 2025. 
So through a process of observation, interviews and research, I got to know this community from the Family Justice Center and identified um, what out of the most prominent trends and innovations that we have happening in our creative sector and in, in the creative economy that would best serve the Family Justice Center. So I developed and uh, um, can we fast forward to the uh, advice and recommendations since we're kind of at the end before Q and A? Is that okay? I'm going to go to no your problem. First, sure. First, uh, advance advice and recommendations slide. Thank you. No problem. So what I would say is it's important to remember that the arts are naturally cross-sectoral. So it means that naturally artists can work as creative strategists in every sector in the community, health, government, business, environment, nonprofit, creative and education. We are the connective tissue of any community. So it means having a clear understanding of what your community, the landscape of your community I would say don't fear. Really, it's important to understand um, the value of what you bring to the table. I didn't have the opportunity to talk about the arts prescription program. Hopefully that will happen at a, at a later time. But um, know that what you bring to the table is important. People need what you have to offer. Always in terms of funding and money, always ask for more than what you imagine people will pay because people value what they pay for. Don't be intimidated by fancy job titles of people who are working in government or working in the business sector um, because people are people. And if you have a clear understanding of what you have to offer, they will very likely say yes. It's important to remain flexible. Um, and this means understanding the meaning of the yes that you might receive. So is it a, a yes that's a handshake? Is it a yes that is um, in process or it, is it a bold and capital letter yes, which means you've signed on the dotted line? It's, it's important to kind of um, be aware of what kind of yes that you are receiving and to remain flexible. Be sure to have a plan C, B, C, and D. Uh, for whatever project you're working on um, and know that there is always a way to make it happen. In terms of knowing the landscape of your work, assertively pursue cross-sector partnerships for the short, mid, and long term. This is really um, the clearest route to success, I would say, whether you're pursuing arts and health um, work or work with any other sector outside of the creative sector follow and 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 know the research around current trends and identify if you're in an echo chamber or if you're in a silo if you are um, be sure to you know connect with thought leaders and 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 understand what's the strategic planning for the different sectors in your community and the very last thing i would say is um, do the work to increase your value um, that means not only recognizing and recognizing and accepting the fact that the role that artists play in the community has shifted since the pandemic. Identify where you stand out. Take the time to invest in yourself and in your organization through leadership and capacity building. Understand clearly what you excel at and be able to articulate it in seven or eight different ways so that the language that you're speaking can be heard and understood by the sector, the leaders in the sector that you are approaching. And the very last thing I would say is to believe in yourself, have faith and pursue with strategic action. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. We will have all of the slides um, available for attendees, and I'm sure this won't be the last I will hear from our speakers today, so please stay tuned and stay connected. Um, now I'm gonna pass it over to Julie, who's gonna kind of moderate and guide uh, in our last uh, section here with Q&As with all of the speakers. So if all the speakers can turn on their camera, I will bring them all back to the spotlight. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, 
for uh, presenting today. Uh, it's always tough to try and uh, take all of the work that you're doing in such a big arena and put it into 10 minutes. So apologize that we had to shorten many of the presentations here today and just uh, invite everyone who um, has stayed with us to um, access the uh, follow-up email that will have all of the slides that everyone put together for their presentation. So, and of course you can reach out to everyone directly as well um, uh, to learn more, but everyone here, just an incredible powerhouse of folks doing amazing work. And I think it's really interesting to get the perspective from an artist working in community, from a journalist working um, in, in covering this issue and in, in, in now in, in a book form, and then from someone leading a, a very large uh, local arts agency in, uh, for the County of Los Angeles and all the different ways that you can implement and advocate from inside, outside, and as an artist and as a journalist and everything towards a common goal. So one of the things we wanted to ask each of you with the information that you shared today, what can our listeners do to advocate for arts and health in their communities from your perspective? And if you can keep it to about a minute each, that would be great. Uh, so Kristen, I'm gonna ask you, go for you with you first, if you could. Sure, well, I think a number of things uh, have been said today that folks can do. I mean, part of it is truly telling the story. So helping people, whether they're lay people, whether they're folks who work in health, whether they're folks who work in other sectors, your elected officials, anybody, but really think about the levers that you have of influence to actually articulate, don't just know, articulate for people, help make the connection that arts is part of health and well-being. And as you've heard today, there's such a wide range of that. I mean, truly like when people are like, yeah, how do I go exercise? Well, also dancing, singing, like singing for 20 minutes a day is literally proven to help your cardiovascular system. I mean, literally the physical health plus the mental health coming together, all those things. So I think articulating it and whatever way you can uplift the visibility of this, I think is a huge step that we know uh, is needed. And so turning that into whatever advocacy means to you, I do think that is a big um, help. And then of course, getting more demand. So we want people to demand to have arts in their schools or to have um, more training programs if you're uh, going to college or getting a degree in something else in public health or in other kind of related things to say we want actually more connection on this here and of course you can demand it with your <laughs> elected officials too in, in straight ahead like advocacy um, in that way too so those are just some things that come to mind thank you thanks so much and so julia from your perspective big, so you're, you kind of see the whole of this from a na national, international. What do you think folks that are like starting to go, wow, this is really exciting. I want to be a part of this. What can they do to advocate from your perspective um, and particularly as a journalist and, and, and in the media? That's a great question. Thank you so much. I definitely want to echo what Kristen shared, you know, like it sounds cliche, but um, <laughs> talk to your doctor about arts prescribing, talk to your doctor about you know, your therapist about social prescribing. I mean, the more that that term trends, the more that that is a word in our vocabulary, I think the more we can manifest this as an actual option. And then if you are working in healthcare, um, encourage you to check out Social Prescribing USA. I know you've had Dr. Siegel on here before um, to connect with, the, to join the community of practice of people actually building opportunities for arts prescribing into their health and healthcare. Um, and also check out the research on socialprescribing.co. Like maybe you are an organization that's seeking funding. I would encourage you to check out some of the rigorous research showing that, yes, this is not just a nice to have participating in the arts, engaging with the arts, prescribing an artistic experience actually does have not only all of these positive health outcomes like we saw with Kuhn, but also can reduce pressures on health care. I mean, that is a golden phrase too for, you know, folks who are supporting um, uh, different movements in health care. So those are just a couple of suggestions to start us off. That's awesome. And Nicole, from your perspective as, a, as an artist, what do you think on how an artist can best advocate in their community for arts and health? Well, I would say, um, you know, in my personal experience, the answer when talking about arts prescription and advocating for arts and health and people wanting to learn more about the intersections between arts and health, the answer has always been yes. Uh, one thing that I didn't get to say is that the project that was developed through California Creative Corps 
and prepared through the California Creative Corps actually went directly into this new um, arts prescription program, which is going to be developed with uh, Ventura County Behavioral Health um, and is going to be launched in late 2024 uh, for 20 months with a $1 million budget. So the answer is yes. Um, you just have to speak the right language, know the research, be confident in what you have to offer, learn the landscape of other artists and arts organizations that are um, in your community, and be, you know, tenacious. Don't give up. Keep asking. Seek uh, cross-sector partnerships, braided funding. Keep moving forward. That's what I'd That's say. That's terrific. And it's exciting to see because I think what you just described, too, is this sort of like you went from education to socialization to now operationalizing an arts and prescription program with funding in Ventura County. So really the full arc of what we, we see in terms of um, effective advocacy. And if I can summarize what everyone was saying too is important is key talking points, which I want you to know we will be providing in, a, in this whole sort of summary after all of these webinars that Jennifer and our team are putting together in terms of what are the key advocacy talk, talking points. Some of this being sort of what you're hearing in repetition around, like what uh, Kristen, when you were sharing about the 20 minutes of singing, like those are the things or the cost benefits, right, to healthcare for and to communities for, to prescribing arts, right? So these sorts of key talking points and getting it to a place where people understand what is social prescribing, what does it mean to get 12 doses of the arts, things like that. Those are the things that once we start to hear our elected officials or the people who are in cross-sector, in public health, saying these things and not the arts saying them, then we know we've also gone into effective advocacy. So, and then I would say the other thing that I heard is coalition building, right? We may not to call it that you're talking about like who are the people that you're working with but like media and journalism is a key piece to our coalition right so having the books come out having press about this as a term and as issues uh that we can affect is a really key piece of um promotion for for the advocacy so who's your, who's in your coalition who can be your cross part sector partners in this who are the types of folks that can help lift this up in your community who are the influencers who can get the ear and uh, of the people who may need to be convinced that this is something. So I think these are all ways that we can be effective in our advocacy. So there's so much richness in all of the fabulous people here today. So thank you so much for showing up, uh, taking the time out of your day, your busy days, coming from New York, coming from LA, coming from Ventura County um, to share uh, this really important info. And and um, I'm going to pass it to the uh, CA for the Arts team to, to wrap us up because the 90 minutes goes fast. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jolie. Thank you to all of the panelists that uh, shared today. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our creative moment facilitators and speakers who presented in this arts and health webinar series for the last four series or four sessions. We have had dynamic speakers, and great creative moment facilitators. And a big thank you to the incredible audience, all of you for being so engaging. And another shout out to the Music Man Foundation for their support. Remember, you can watch the recordings on of all of the webinars on YouTube, on our YouTube playlist. And also please take a moment to fill out a post webinar survey link that's been shared by Terry in the chat box. And it will also be shared in our follow-up email with resources from today. We'd like to get to know you and your feedback will help in us creating future programs. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter to learn about future programming and follow us on social media to stay informed about future events. Again, thank you all for joining us today. And until next time, let's continue to build a more creative and healthier California.